All right, so I present to you Stephanie Murray, who will be presenting her presentation. Um, Invisible Archives of John Edgar Whiteman's Two Cities. Good afternoon, I'm Stephanie Mary, and here is my presentation, Invisible Archives in John Edgar Whiteman's Two Cities. Uh, I do want to give out a quick warning that on slide number four there will be a graphic image regarding a certain magazine cover, so feel free to just avert your eyes and just keep on listening. So, today I will be presenting to you Invisible Archives, this collection is a special case because it is not even real, yet that doesn't mean it has no impact. So my argument to you all is that just because you cannot see a photographic archive does not mean that it has no statement to make. The subject of today's presentation is the riveting essay called Black Not Blank by Petra Dreiser, as seen in the critical journal Mosaic, accessed via JSTOR. Being a longtime fan of Greek mythology, I was tickled pink upon first reading the author's comparisons between classical heroes and the modern protagonist of the novel. So his abstract reads as follows. This essay examines the photographic practice at the heart of John Edgar Whiteman's Two Cities. Considering the photographs as a kind of archive, it suggests that they reflect the problematic framework of black visual representation in dominant American culture while simultaneously pointing to the possibility of a radical new vision. So it opens with a quote from James Baldwin in the work, The Devil Finds Work. The camera sees what you want it to see. The language of the camera is the language of our dreams. And it also opens by comparing Emmett Till to Medusa. So, who is John Edgar Wideman and what did he do? Well, he's an African-American writer and professor emeritus at Brown University who grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The majority of his writing takes place in the Easy End Home Wood neighborhood. He wrote Two Cities, a novel about a widow mourning her dead husband and sons, and Martin Mallory, her tenant, a photographer and a war veteran documenting the 50-year history of life in the African-American neighborhoods of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Upon reading the novel, you could say that Mallory is Weinman's avatar, despite the fact that the author is not a photographer himself. So the novel concerns a fictional archive. The story centers around the death of a photographer who leaves behind a box of photographs and negatives with instructions to burn them. This is a novel that uses history, notably having fictional characters interact with real photographs about real historical figures. One example is Mallory reacting to the image of Emma Till as seen on the cover of Jet Magazine. Martin Mallory is the fictional photographer likened to Perseus, who symbolically steals the head of Medusa by reclaiming the camera from stereotyping African Americans in history and culture to create a counter-narrative of livid black experience. His mission is as follows. How can I make photos that invite a viewer to stroll around them, he asks. I want people to see my pictures from various angles, see the image I offer as many images, one among countless ways of seeing. If I ever get good, my picture will remind people to keep a world alive around them, to keep themselves alive at the center of a storm of swirling emptiness. So looking through her tenant's unfinished work after his death, and by the way, this is how his collection is introduced in the novel, Cosima, the landlady, discovers boxes over boxes full of negatives she considers quote-unquote ruined. Nothing on the negatives. Everyone I looked at, just blank, all grayed out. Having manipulated his camera's film forwarding mechanism to allow for the stacking of dozens and hundreds of exposures on the same square of film, Mr. Mallory produces images glistening 
in sometimes denser, sometimes lighter shades of gray. So here Dreiser is arguing that appearances can be deceiving, or is at least setting up the idea. So a few points to take away from Mallory's collection. His archive consists of densely layered multiple exposure shots with the intent of empowering others to free themselves. The majority of his photographs do not exist as prints. The individuals in them are indistinguishable. There is invisibility due to over scrutiny. They have murky gray compositions. They're not exactly blank as it appears at first glance to the viewers in the novel. There is a very clear evasion of the sort of in-your-face corporeality that you might see in an image like the one that you saw earlier on Jet Magazine. And then they've been processed film strips that show traces of physical bodies. And you'll note that readers cannot actually see his pictures, not even verbally, but this narrative choice is intentional in that it symbolizes the societal invisibility of his subjects. To be more specific, there is the specter of the second sight, in which you have the ability to see more clearly from behind the veil, separating Americans of color from larger white society, as Dresser says on page 195 of his article. Looking through at oneself through others' eyes, another example of this would be, say, women internalizing the male gaze and how it affects the way they dress and present themselves to the outside world. So I wanted to show you an example I found of a double exposure shot. So I found this particular image on Pinterest and chose this one because the subject matter fit. Only half of a black woman's face is shown with the top half cracked, looking like the top of a mountain or an open piece of earth. It is also in black and white. I thought that a half visible face would be a good example of the kind of photography that this fictional character Mallory would have taken even if the image is crystal clear here and obviously created quite recently. So how do his photos subvert? Well, there's a key scene in which Mallory takes his landlady's picture. So this landlady, Cosima, is taken as just me, head to toe, just me, nothing else. American mainstream culture would have just cast her as the welfare queen, the mother of two dead thugs, and or the jail junkie's wife. Even if some of these stereotypes are meant to invoke pity, that too can be a patronizing attitude that objectifies instead of humanizes the subject. As I learned from an eye-opening talk from a recovering racist working with archives from an Indian reservation in one of my other classes from last semester, why pity is but a step above the sheer contempt when it comes to the disenfranchised people of color. So now I wanted to show you an example of a archival collection, a real life social justice photography archive to give you a sense of the kind of work that this fictional archivist has done. It was also brought up in the article that I'm discussing. So I'll show you a couple of images. So I'll just give you the brief rundown. So this recent exhibition at the New York International Center of Photography, or the ICP, was called Only Skin Deep, Changing Visions of the American Self, emphasized the intimate and the complex connections between photography, concepts of race, and national citizenship. So Coco Fusco, one of the curators, writes, photography offers the promise of apprehending who we are, not only as private individuals, but also as members of social and cultural groups, as public citizens, as Americans. No other means of representing human likeness has been used more systematically to describe and formulate American identity than photography. Photographic representation thus becomes a highly political act tied closely to the notions of Americanness, of belonging and not belonging, worth and lack of worth, and all the tenebrous entanglements possible in between much of the work. 
verbal and visual collected in Fusco in curator Brian Wallace's exhibition catalog, Only Skin Deep. And elsewhere calls our attention to the fundamental flaws inscribed into the end of her of searching photographs for truth about the reality they often claim to reflect. So, what can real archive repositories learn from this fictional one? Well, for starters, archives can be ideological and arbiters of what is considered real. If official archive repositories vilify, i.e. photos that are used to employ racist pseudosciences such as anthropotrony, or neglect marginalized peoples, counter archives by members of such groups pop up. Archives have the potential to prevent cultural amnesia. Archives have the potential to impose order on chaotic collections. And one question in particular was raised. Should the archivist keep racially charged records that the photographer has requested to be burned posthumously? And this is the question that I wanted to end this discussion on and that I would like participants here to try to answer based on what you have been learning so far in your archival courses, that is, I don't exactly know how many of you are on the archives track in particular, but even if you're not, feel free to have a stab at the question because I do want to let you know that as far as the novel ends, so Martin Mallory dies somewhat early on and then he has a funeral, and at the funeral a couple of gang violence takes place, and Cosima actually uses the photographs. She shows them to the gang members in order to get him to stop fighting, and somehow it works. Something about what the images show move them in such a way that they disperse. So, any stabs? Certainly, if you keep them, you should have them in a section that says bad ideas uh, or bad, uh, you know, you shouldn't have hold on a pedestal and say, this is what we're about now or this is what we want to be about. But I think it's important to have ra even racially charged images to explain that this is something that still exists and that, that it's still around us and affecting us. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, so, I um, actually work with donors in my current position at the Library Library and Library of Library Labor Archives. People who are transferring their, their materials to the archives. Um, and from that experience, I know that there are um, legal standards that um, need to be maintained. So, there is an agreement between the University who's taking the materials and the person donating, saying like, once I give you my materials, you can't just get rid of them willy-nilly. If you decide to get rid of them, you have to give them back to me to, in order to, for me to say, oh, actually, I do need this. Uh, so, a donor saying, oh, just get rid of this is, is not enough. Um, what I've seen happen is um, donors say, oh, I want these materials to be in the archive, but I want them to be restricted for 20 years or 25 years. Um, and one of the examples that I saw was a group of women who organized around reproductive rights. So in their materials, there, were, um, there was information about teenage girls who went to get abortions. And for obvious reasons, they didn't want people to see those names. Um, so I think it's a little bit more complicated by the legal standards as well. Okay, great, thank you. Great perspective. So I'm, I should say I'm not in archives and I know very little about archives, but um, something that I'm thinking of is if someone decides to donate material with like something like, like a restricted access stipulation, then, and then an a archivist decides to disregard anything that this donor said, it kind of leaves an image on the archivist and on the profession as being somewhat untrustworthy and that will then affect future donation decisions. So 
really, even if something is restricted for a few years, it's better that it be restricted for a few years and later come out for the public than if you're never allowed to get these, or you, you never get the chance to get this material because someone decides that you are untrustworthy and you aren't going to hold, um, hold your word or, or hold yourself accountable for what you and your profession does. Thank you. I, I just had a question. Um, is in the in the scenario is the photographer requesting for the archive to burn the photos or for someone else to burn them? Uh, for the landlady to burn them. The landlady. Um, so I'm also not a person in the archives profession or track, um, but I think the question that is raised ties into our relationship with the deceased and those who are still living, um, and especially in a case like this fictional one where this guy apparently did not have any next of kin, so he left you know, for whoever finds this archive, please just burn it. The question becomes, what do we owe the dead? And I don't really have an answer to that, but I think, like, the question the question of, should the archivist keep things that somebody requests to be destroyed, ties into that question of, like, what, like, what is our relationship to the dead, what do we owe them, versus what do we owe the future in terms of keeping historical documents? Good question. Yeah, that kind of ties into what I was thinking about, which is like, I feel like the ideas of permanence versus impermanence, I think with traditional archives, this idea of permanence and keeping things forever is kind of woven into the fabric. And I think emerging types of archives and alternative archives maybe question that sense of permanence a little bit. So I feel like archivists have a responsibility also to think about that. No one else has any more answers or questions than all ended on this note. Thank you all very much.